welcome to this very very sunny start of June. Um, it's been a long time coming. This should be a lively discussion looking at um, the FE sector and representation um, within that. Today we have the reformers and this is a group of people that we've, we've assembled in terms of people that bring in different voices from different parts of the sector depending on which perspective they come from and we try to get a good mix in of people that um, have those voices and we're looking at representation from the point of view of um, our leadership within our FE sector. No doubt some of the stats will be coming forward but in terms of is it representation of the communities that we serve or look to serve and does it actually matter? Does, does representation actually matter? There's a lot of press, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of articles about this and a lot of people speak about that if you can't see it, you can't be it. You know, how true is that? And hopefully we can sort of like start delving into some of those issues today. And then the second theme that we've got is our curriculum, is our provision that we have within the FE sector, uh, enabling all of our learners to engage at the same level. And, uh, and if it's not... And um, where are the challenges and how do we start addressing some of those? Now, within a one hour session, there is no way we're going to get to any meaningful point in terms of where we can sort of walk away with a, a complete checklist of, of um, actions that we can perform. But we're hoping that these three sessions that we've had, and this being the third of those sessions, we're able to start those conversations in a meaningful way that will lead to... Um, those actions that will take place within the colleges wherever you happen to be. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome on the virtual stage Reginda K. Mann OBE. I'd like to turn your camera and your mic on Reginda. Welcome. Hello, um, Arv. Hi. Um, Reginda is the uh, Vice Chair for Burton and South Derbyshire College. That's one of her newer roles. Um, she's had many roles, by the way, and I was trying to pick out which things do I spotlight today. And she's also a board member uh, for the Institute for Further Education. So I think those are the two most pertinent roles for what we're doing currently on these sessions. Um, but there is, I'm sure you're going to pull in a lot of your expertise to do with lots of different things that you've been involved in in the years that you've been within the sector. So I'd like to hand over to you, Reginda, now to uh, start the sessions and introduce our panel. That's lovely. Thanks, Arv, and welcome, everybody. This is um, a, a real privilege to be uh, chairing a session which is looking at uh, you know, representation and the curriculum. I think um, over the last few years, we've spent a number of years trying to make colleges and you know the workforce sector look more representative and it'll be good to see you know the distance traveled uh, listening to our uh, panel members so I'm going to introduce them first of all welcoming Altaf Hussain principal and CEO Luton Sixth Form College good afternoon folks going on to Jeff Greenwich who's recently joined the Association of Colleges and the Education Training Foundation in a shared post, um, so which is must be a really interesting post, Jeff. Yeah, it's fascinating. Thank you, Regina. Going on to Julie, uh, Julie Mills, CEO of Milton Keynes College Group, and I'd like to say thank you, Julie, for um, starting the conversation and taking the lead. Thanks, Regina. It's great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Okay, most of you will know the next person, Salat Chowdhury, Group and Chief Executive from the National Centre for Diversity. Hi, hi, Regina. Hi, all. Cindy Rampasad. Pearson's BTEC and Apprenticeships, and she is the Senior Vice President there. Hey everybody, and thanks Reginda, and, and it's um, really great that this series of discussions are happening, so delighted to be here today. Thank you. And finally, and not, not in the least, is Sheila Legrave, who's currently the Chief Exec of Chichester College Group, but also the Designate FE Commissioner, so welcome and congratulations on your new role as well, Sheila really important role. Thank you very much indeed and uh, it's a privilege to join such a group of people to discuss something that's very close to my heart. Thank you. So I'd like to um, start the conversation. Obviously I've been looking at uh, digging some facts and figures up and in terms of representation and I'm going with the Association of Colleges and Jeff you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this so I'm only going by with the facts and figures that I've got at hand. And looking at that, I mean, I'm looking at the 16 to 18 year old group from the Black, Black um, Asian Minority Ethnic Communities. And we've got 26% of our learners are from that community. And then of course, from the adult um, Black and Minority Ethnic uh, Communities, it's 32%. So I'm not going to go into the gender figures. I'll focus specifically around uh, diversity in particular. 
So if you look at those figures, I'd like to sort of open up the question and I'll start off with Altaf, Julie and Jeff firstly. But of course, all of panel, member, panel members are you know, open to um, answering some of those questions. If you've got things to say, do join us. So our first question is, are all colleges representative of the communities they serve? And linked, obviously, to that question is, is it important that they are? So shall I take Altaf? Shall we start with you on that one? Yeah, I'm happy to kick off. Uh, yes and no to the first one, Regenda, and yes to the second question. If I can expand on that, I'll start off with the end in mind, really. So mm -hmm. for those people who know me, they will probably roll their eyes at this point and say, there you go again, because I'm convinced that the future prime minister of this country will come from Luton Sickworm College. Now, that's my starting point. And then I'm working backwards in terms of what we need to do to actually take away the obstacles that are in front of that student of mine. And that student might be studying with me right now, might be starting with me, with me next year. So representation depends on what we mean by representation so if it's a tick boxing exercise that's not really for me representation for me means values driven leadership so if we are impressed by titles and by money that isn't where we instill those and infuse those values into our young people so for me kindness empathy generosity humility and then equity and fairness. So let me expand on the equity and fairness a little bit more. For me, that's a fundament, fundamental principle. It's a big ticket item. And for me, just my view, I feel that it's deprivation which stops young people from socially becoming mobile. And if then you add on to that race, if you add on to that gender, sexuality, disability, protected characteristics and other aspects, that just amplifies what the deprivation is actually already there about. So there's some big items that we need to address. Now, you know, we talk about deprivation. My students come from some of the most deprived wards and Reginda, very sensibly you started about having measures. If you can't have measures, you can't improve. They come mm -hmm. from deprived backgrounds, 70% are from ethnic minorities. They have caring responsibilities. They have so many obstacles to jump through before they even walk through my doors. COVID has just widened that gap, in my, mm -hmm. in my humble opinion. And yet, 98.9% .9 of my students go on to positive destinations. 75% go on to university. A big chunk go on to Russell Group universities, but not enough, because in my opinion, the people who are pulling the strings in Russell Group universities, I don't feel are representative of the young people and the journeys that they've gone through. The final block is finance. You know, so today, you know, the government have announced something which didn't surprise me. You know, a 1.4 billion package, etc which will not even touch the sides. And for me, as, a, as an inclusive college, and I haven't got all the, the, the advantages of independent schools and all the money that can throw with skills development, I want to not only give them the best possible education and be an inclusive organization so we can actually keep them coming into my place, but also I want to spend money on things like DOV. I want to spend money on enrichment activities, all those aspects mm -hmm. that privilege young people. And I'm not having a go of privileged young people. If their parents work hard and they want them to send them to privileged areas, brilliant. But for me today, what the government has actually demonstrated to me is it's rhetoric, you know, actually that the, the intentions don't back up the behaviours, and that really depresses me. Now, I don't want to finish on a negative, because despite all of that, people in FE, people in colleges and people in schools have been absolutely extraordinary this year, and we will find a way. And the end in mind for me is that one of my students one day will be a future prime minister. And why I say that is because... I want that person who has been infused with the values of Luton Sick Form College, understands all the obstacles that real human beings like you and I have to jump through, who mm -hmm. then can be shaping educational policy, shaping kind of all sorts of strategy with one eye back on their journey when they walk through Luton Sick Form College's doors. So that is the end in mind, and there are obstacles, but we will overcome them. Thank you, Altaf. That's really wonderful. It's great to hear you start off with a really positive raised aspirations because that, 
you know, is linked to representation. And we'll go into that as we continue. I'm going to hand over to um, Julie and then we'll move on to Jeff. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, Virginia, and thanks, Altaf. I second everything you've said. It was really fantastic to, to hear it and an absolutely brilliant analysis of, of where I think we are as, as, a, as a sector as well. I would just um, throw in here that I am myself an ex-student of Milton Keynes, of, um, uh, of Luton Sixth Form, so maybe I should think about a career in politics and <laughs> who knows, inspired by that. But I, I think, um, for me, the, the answer is, as you say, yes and no. Yes, in terms of, I think we do reach much of our community in terms of the offer although I'm going to be really interested to hear the curriculum discussion later on but absolutely not I think in terms of workforce and I do think that 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 is an, an issue for us in in the sector and I think it, it is it is important now I um you know I'm, I'm passionate about about FE I've, I've already fessed up that I went to Luton sixth form I also attended Barnfield for a while for a while as well I absolutely love it and and there is a, a big part of me that's that's really disappointing that kind of over 30 years on in being in the sector we're still having these discussions slightly different language because language moves on but actually oh. the general point I think is 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 still the same and I do think it's a it's our problem um, and as the leader of an institution whose workforce is not fully representative of the communities we are part of I think that is a problem and I think it is is our problem to to solve um, and as we work on shifting that workforce profile which isn't going to be super quick I think it's absolutely critical that we also act on making sure that our students and our colleagues have regular and routine access to, to role models because I really believe in the power of of role models you started off Regina saying you know if you can see it you can be it and I think although that's maybe a bit hackneyed for some people I think the the power of seeing somebody that you can relate to and recognize in whatever whatever role is is really important and I know that in my career having worked with leaders from different backgrounds with different characteristics I know that colleagues who share those characteristics feel more comfortable you know feel it's almost as if they have a sense of I'm going to be okay here um, I can succeed here I, I guess in modern parlance we talk about belonging and I, I do think that's mm -hmm. really important for students um, and for staff so um, yeah in answer to that question does it matter I think it I think it does I guess my optimistic point to to end on having been disappointed that we're we haven't made progress as a sector I think in, particularly in terms of workforce but the the optimism I have at this point is that I do think I can sense a shift in the narrative. I do think there is a broader range of more diverses being heard, certainly, and starting to be amplified. And I do think there is a sense that more individuals and institutions are ready to listen. I guess the proof of the pudding is going to be if that listening and dialogue and debate translates into actions that, that deliver positive change. Thank you, Julie. And I agree with you. I think that there is a real sea change um, in the, you know, the, in the environment. And certainly a lot more is being done. It's more than just, um, you know, words that people are paying lip service uh, with, but there is a real sort of change in terms of people wanting to see, you know, the hearts and minds engaging with the agenda. And I think that's really, you know, really positive. I don't know, um, Jeff, if, you know, you feel the same and if you want to pick up on any of the points that have already been said by Altef and Julie. Yeah, I think I'll pick up on most of the points there. I think um, I do feel the same. I, I sense there is um, Julie's optimism. I think that's out there in the in the sector. And clearly Altef's passion is out there in the sector. But what I also see, I also see action taking place in the sector. Maybe not as fast as we would like, but things, things are taking place. And back to Altef's point about his student becoming a prime minister, that is, that is going to be the case because it's the young people who are actually beginning to change um, the dynamic. They're the ones who are pushing things forward. Just think about um, Malala Yousafzai, she's 23. Greta Thunberg is 18. Um, there's a guy called Malone McQuady who has published a book which shows how uh, black skin is um, poorly treated by the medical conditions. And I'm one of those people who suffer from one of those conditions. And it's great to see that now being used by doctors. And the guy's in second year of medical school. So these things are happening. West Suffolk College, um, the students there developed a black history curriculum. Uh, they decided to do it themselves and they got their teachers to help them to do it. So these young people are actually changing things. So I think we've got something happening there that we can build on. 
We build on the young people. And clearly we have the people in the middle like us. Uh, we're there and we are having those conversations now. And so that again is changing. Uh, there are other people perhaps at the top who are the enablers and we need to do something about them and help them to, to begin thinking about um, change. But things are happening. Altaf's point about diversity and being more than just gender, race or ethnicity, absolutely correct. You know, we're talking there about people with diverse religions, diverse political beliefs, you know, the socioeconomic backgrounds are, are different, sexual orientation, the neurodiversity and different abilities. We have a, a plethora of um, potential skills and attributes that we can make the most of mm -hmm. and Julie's point there about diversity in the workplace it's an asset if in the in the commercial world uh, it's seen as an asset uh, because you get, you get employees from different uh, backgrounds who come together to foster innovation creativity and those things uh, give companies competitive edge so why wouldn't the further education sector begin to use some of those practices and, um, and principles. The thing that's taken so long, I suspect it's because it will take time. It takes careful nurturing. It takes um, almost what I would call conscious orchestration. You know, you have to have a plan in place. This may look perhaps uh, scattergunned, but that there's a train of thought they're going through because it is about people's mindsets. It is about a shifting culture, a culture towards inclusion, and not necessarily focusing on the problem of diversity, but focusing on the solution, which uh, it may well be something like inclusion. We have the challenge of biases uh, around things. And again, something I feel quite positive about. Lots of boards now are beginning to have that conversation, not because she was here, but her board last week had that conversation uh, around how can we get this board more diverse? Where do we go to find... Um, not necessarily, we're not finding diverse people, we're finding diverse talent. And we're finding talent in our organizations, in our communities. Instead of looking for the big five, why do we go and look at the community organizations there where that guy's an entrepreneur, that woman's an entrepreneur, and they are bringing those, um, marketing those um, uh, big business skills to, um, to the table. And that's the conversation that Chichester College Group had last week uh, at, their, um, at their board table. So is diversity important? Absolutely, it's a no-brainer. Uh, with inclusion, we will get diversity, we'll increase representation. The moral argument is, is clear, that's been, that's been won. The business case is, 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 again, is clear. I think that there's, the trick we have to do is to pull in those three strands, the student strand, the um, middle strand, that's the, the management, that's us, I suppose, and then ensure those enablers the officers of this world, the FE commissioners of this world, the off of this world, that they're also doing their bit to enable us to um, make it happen. But I'll, I'll pause there because there's more conversation to, to come. Thank you, Jeff. At this point, I'm just going to ask if um, Salah, Cindy and Sheila might want to add anything. I'm very uh, happy to come in here. So I absolutely share the optimism that's been expressed so far, but I think there's a whole load more things that we need to do. Some of it is at policy level. I was fascinated to see the AOC's uh, refresh of the government's code, which includes something around measuring diversity. That's a great step. Some of it is around inspiring staff at all levels to realise how important this is, that diversity of thought. And I think whilst there is a groundswell of young people there's more work to do, certainly that's my experience in my own college group, with identification of individual staff, but they do have an unconscious bias, and therefore we need to, to open the conversations out, and that was very much part of the, of the work that Jeff came and um, joined us at board level. But it's also, to me, disgraceful that we still have such a difference in terms of student outcomes nationally for people of a different ethnic colour to, to white. If you look at the outcomes, you'll see that um, we've got people who are underachieving. And I don't certainly have all the answers, but it's something we've got to focus on. Some of that's around the curriculum discussion that we're about to, to move into, but some of it is also around role models. And we haven't got enough role models at the moment which is um, why I agree with the answers to the first question, which is we don't have those re that representation there in order 
to, to raise that aspiration at all levels. Thank you, Sheila. So can I just, um, Regina, just very quickly, because I know we want to come on to the second topic, but I, I think um, I would agree with everything that the panellists have said, which is that um, there is greater awareness um, and and certainly a, a good discussion happening around change. And I think, you know, Jeff's point about it doesn't happen overnight, but actually we must keep pushing to make sure that there's momentum around this change, to mm -hmm. Sheila's point around things like policy but I think um, we know that it's not representative enough um, or representative of the learners and the communities that it serves and I think a key thing here is um, is data and visibility and transparency coupled with a really clear talent um, plan which Sheila mm -hmm. talked about you know knowing your talent and developing talent and and actually creating an environment where talent can flourish and then the, I think the third element is education and learning and part of education and learning is identifying where unconscious bias exists or bias exists and really kind of looking at how we we kind of tackle that in a way that is inclusive and that kind of drives the right behaviors so that um, institutions and, and the sector can move forward. So I think um, data and accountability, clear talent strategy and real education and learning and, and holding people to account around behaviors are probably three elements that I think we need to consider. Thank you. That's uh, You've summed that up really nicely, Cindy. Um, Solo, before I come back in. Yes, uh, right. So just in terms of role models, I agree with what people have said. Just to make an extra point about that is that um, when I was growing up, um, I, I was really mad keen on football. and I had no role models from an Asian background. My nearest role model was the great Sura Regis, the late great Sura Regis. Very curious choice for a skinny Asian little boy, which I was at the time. <laughs> I'm not now, alas. But uh, considering that Sura Regis had the biggest muscles I've ever seen in football, uh, but the, the point is, I had to latch onto some somebody that looked like me, so I could believe that I could be in that position as well. But it's not just only important for me, and it's not just only important for the black footballers that can trans translate into becoming going to black, you know, managers, uh, black managers going to football. But it's important that if I if I can't see it, I can't be. But it's also important that if society can't see it. The society won't allow us to beat as well because the brain unfortunately when it sees two things joined together it begins to bind them together uh, again and again and again so white chief exec white male chief exec when you see that the more often you see it the more the brain binds it together and it becomes very incongruous to see a woman asian black uh, disabled chief exec so not only you know, you, you can't you can't be unless you see it. The society needs to be able to see it in order for you to be as well. So it's a bit like a chicken and an egg situation. Thank you, Sola. So um, whose responsibility should it be then uh, in terms of driving that change? Is, is it the governing body? Is it leaders? Who, who should be? Should we be having a national strategy for driving that change? Or should it be something that we can drive at a local level? I think, I mean, I'm happy to, to, to kick off. I think, um, yes, to all of those approaches, actually. And, and I think, you know, as the as the chief exec, it's my responsibility, but as everybody who, uh, who and it's my governing board body's a responsibility, and actually everyone who joins the, the college, part of what, what we would try and do, you know, kind of echoing Al, Altaf's um, description from earlier on is about work with our students to really focus on values led behaviors and, and what that means and to have those have those debates and, and try and tackle and challenge those issues. I think we have as a sector neglected to do that with our staff and I think that's um, something which we've probably slipped on over the last 20 or so years and actually probably underplayed our the importance of colleges in creating those opportunities not just for excellent learning for all of our community but also for excellent careers for all of our, our community and so I you know that that kind of issue around responsibility is a really important one and if there was a national strategy I guess that makes it easier for everybody to get on the bus than everybody mm. having to do to to do it on their own but actually I don't think it negates the fact that people also need to take responsibility and and, and do it on their own. Thank you Jeff I think we've had a question that's come through which um, uh, are you going to answer that? Uh, yes I could I was actually going to pick up on the point that you were making um, there as well I, I, I'll answer the question as well yes but 
I think it is everyone's responsibility to take these actions, really, because ultimately a college is a self-governing uh, body that has a responsibility for a, a huge area and, and to be seen as being the, the lead in that area. So it's absolutely the college's responsibility to, to uh, take action to support their students to um, progress, to give them that leg up that um, we in education want to give our students. It's absolutely the college's responsibility to look at, to the community. You know, if I'm working in a particular community, surely I'd want to be representative of my consumers because they're consuming my product in that in the in that in in that sense. And I have a staff to support to get the best out of uh, the staff, so they can get the, the best out of the out of the students. So that's absolutely the college's responsibility. I think where we get the issue about um, uh, national strategies is that there are other organizations, I'm working for both, for, for two of them, ETF, AOC. For me, they're, they're there as enablers. They have tools, they have uh, thought, they can gather information that can support the college in those three strands, you know, the student strand, the workforce strand, and the community strand. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, regulatory bodies, the ESFA, um, Ofqual, et cetera, and they can make things happen or they can stop things. And sometimes, sometimes it's through uh, accident, more than through intent, that things don't align. You know, we have a we have a classic case now where a lot of um, black and Asian black students, in particular, are doing BTECs, and then you have another group of students who are doing um, uh, A levels. Now, how has that happened? That we have this disparity in in, in populations. No, that your figures there about 26% in, in FE, that's absolutely right. Um, there's a, a large proportion of black students within further education. So where are they in the other parts of the of the of the sector? So the, there's something which is not, I don't think it's intentional, but there are mismatches which cause that systemic um, issue. So I think we, we've all got a, a role to play in this. And the challenge is how we how we fit our particular roles um, together. Um, Chinda, can I come in? Um, on, on something you said, Jeff, which is um, about the number of black students doing BTEC, because I think, you know, my challenge would be, and I'm sure you didn't mean it like this, no, no. but my challenge would be, let's not just assume that because those kids are doing a BTEC, that somehow they're doing something that's less. And likewise, for many of the adults who do vocational pathways and go into further education, so the 32% of adults that Julie talked about, they'll be doing vocational pathways which are about helping them. So I think we all need to check ourselves a little bit. And I know we're coming on to the discussion about curriculum, but curriculum is also about the pathways. It's about the assessment and it's about the outcomes. So it's not just one piece, it's the kind of whole thing. And the reason I, I kind of pick up on this is, you know, I was really struck, as I'm sure many of you were, by the BBC documentary, um, Subnormal, A British Scandal, where um, kids from the Caribbean were tested using the established um, system. And of course they failed and they kind of were put into remedial classes or proofs. Actually, it's about understanding the journey and it goes to the, the, the comments that I think Alta, Altaf was making. It's about understanding their journey the, the kind of background, the kind of cultural context. And, and that's not just race, it's also social economic. And I think we need to be careful. We don't make kind of assumptions and actually we should be bigging up the successes of the kind of role models from from you know this isn't about a kind of BTEC these but a different different pathways and and different careers so the other example that I'll, I'll use and I'll, I'll stop after this and talking about role models Dragon's Den have got a new um, dragon haven't they which I'm sure many of you know a 28 year old young black man called Stephen Bartlett and he has become successful by setting up a kind of business, his own business, in a new area. So social media marketing, which most people wouldn't even have thought about having or, or doing. So I guess my, my point is that whilst we look at all of this change, we also need to, and drive change and drive the right change, we need to look at what some of the other changes are that are happening and how we feed all of that in, in order to make um, uh, you know, people really access the right curriculum, the right pathways, that we're assessing them correctly and not making judgments or, or, or narrowing them. Um, and, and Sheila, to your point, looking at the outcomes. So 
I, I just sometimes think we just need to be careful that we're not almost kind of putting a, a, a badge on them when when it's it's not a negative badge when it's not worthy. I think. Thank you, Cindy. And um, um, representation, of course, starts at all levels. Um, you know, it's not just about our uh, staff, but it's also about the governing bodies. It's also about learners. I mean, it's not just about the areas that we're serving in. You know, if we've got to prepare our students and our learners for the global um, global village. And so I think this is hopefully conversation and we'll have lots of questions that will enable us to carry on this. But I'm swiftly moving on um, onto our second question, which is, do we have a curriculum that our learners can engage with? And I know, Cindy, we've already sort of started off with that. So I'm going to start off with you. Yeah, um, I think the thing about curriculum, I think quite clearly, if outcomes are very different for different groups of students, there's something that we need to work harder on with curriculum. But I don't think it's just curriculum. So I think there's this thing, this point about curriculum being relevant. And I think the relevance of curriculum um, to support progression and, and access to careers is probably even more prevalent and important as we're coming out of COVID. So mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, to the point of 32% of adults from a black and ethnic minority background doing studying in, in the further education sector. Many of those would have been most impacted by COVID because the data is telling us that in terms of furlough redundancy, loss of, loss of earnings. The point about relevance is the curriculum and the whole infrastructure around our, our sector needs to be able to support those learners to access the curriculum where they're going to be able to flourish in their lives in terms of careers. So I think it's not just about the attainment that they might get straight away in terms of the grade, but it's about where they end up in their career and in their life. Um, and I, I kind of want to come back to the point that Atif made very, very quickly, which is we always get caught up in curriculum and curriculum is important. And we've been doing a lot of work looking at our editorial policy, the writers that we work with, but actually it's broader than that. It's about our talent as well. So who have we got? How are we partnering um, with, with the sector? But I, I think it's broader in that it's curriculum working with the ecosystem of, you know, the FE sector, employers, government, um, and making sure that that it's relevant, we're assessing a way in a way that allows people to succeed. Um, but going back to Jeff's point, I think you can have all of that, but what you also need to embed in the design of curriculum are those bits that are missing around enrichment and cultural capital and kind of those soft skills, because I spent four and a half years in FE and I loved it. Um, you know, I'm City in Islington was 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 fantastic for me and and it really opened my eyes but I am convinced the students that succeeded succeeded because of enrichment and it's what made the difference not just the learning but the enrichment and, and the kind of teaching so I think do we have the right curriculum I think curriculum has to remain relevant and continually change the question is how do we make sure that learners can access the curriculum and really flourish? And what are the additional bits that we need to include in that learning experience? Thank you, Cindy. Um, Sheila, how would you like to sort of pick up on that point too? Thank you, Rachinda. I absolutely agree with the point Cindy's just made. Some of the curriculum I still think needs some work. And, and some of it is the interpretation. So we had, a, I mean, West Sussex is, it has a 10%, um, I think, BAME community, uh, or even smaller than that. And we discovered we weren't delivering hairdressing for those people who needed a different type of um, hairdressing because they didn't had a different type of, of hairstyle. We just hadn't thought about it. So some of it is not that the curriculum isn't there, it's how you actually interpret the curriculum and yeah. it's delivered for, for, for the whole of your, your community. I also agree with Cindy and um, Atal's point earlier. I, I think it is enrichment that's going to make the difference. It's enabling people to hold their own in, in their workplace and have and pick up those soft skills which is going to make them stand out. And we need to do something slightly different, I think, for our different communities to enable that to happen. 
and we've got more work to do on in that area. Thank you, Sheila. Solid. Right, yes, very expansive question. Uh, we could go on all night about it, but I'll try and condense it to just a few minutes. Uh, I think it's really important to take a step back and contextualise the, the whole issue around uh, in, an inclusive curriculum. Um, I, can, I, I guess that's what the question is asking for. And I think to contextualise it in the overall system uh, that we have in, in society, in all societies, uh, a system which enables inclusion, also known as systemic, structural or institutional inequality. It is woven right through all of our societies and there's a big debate about it. And I really don't know why there's a debate about the existence of systemic inequality, uh, and particularly systemic racism. Because if you look at the system, if you're, we're in 2021 now, so that's 2021 years. Let's just take the year dot. Well, the system in this country was developed for one type of person for 1,950 years of that history. And that is essentially Anglo-Saxon white males, uh, heterosexual in the workplace. And all the systems uh, that were nurtured, and the system consists of things like history, legacy, culture, habits, beliefs, the type of sector that you're in, the policies, procedures, and practices. So the system was created for one type of person, and it's only been 70 years uh, where women have been in, uh, in the workforce and, and with no intention of going back as uh, back into their homes as they did after the First World War, where you had mass migration, where you had really changes in legislation which led to LGBTQ plus rights, uh, where disabled people's needs were recognised. So we, we've had about 70 years of that to try to change a system that lasted 1,950 years. So it's inconceivable that system wouldn't exist. So when this Sewell report came out, I was absolutely expected it, but was disappointed that yeah. people who should have known better, didn't know better, and actually gave an excuse to people uh, for perpetuating the system that's been there long enough anyway. So back to the question. <laughs> it's difficult to know the answer of, of do we have a curriculum that, that all learners can engage with? Because I can't see the research. I've, I've done some research myself, I've asked people. I can't see anybody that's done that central research right across the UK or or even nationally in, the, in, in England or, or regionally. So it's difficult to understand. And even if that research had been done, it would have been done BC before COVID. COVID has changed the world in all sorts of different ways. It's changed us. We've changed as people. What we want from life has changed. So when you look at um, culture change in organizations, and we've worked with hundreds if not thousands of them over the 16 years, when you see culture change, you can see it changes as a result of a new chief executive, a merger, acquisition, poor regulatory report, death in service. It changed for all those things, but it changes from the top. For the very first time in my lifetime, my working lifetime, and I'm a stereotypical Asian shopkeeper's son, my mum ran the business, which is not so stereotypical, but I've been working part-time, full-time, in spare time ever since the age of 10. And in all my lifetime, I can see for the very first time that culture change is happening from a different place. And that's happening from grassroots. And in colleges, we're getting loads and loads of reports from people in our network of colleges. And what they're saying is that, look, the students are asking those questions. What are we doing about the whole BLM uh, uh, kind of agenda? What are we doing about George Floyd? What are we doing about policy procedures and practice? What are we doing about systemic racism within our, within our college? And that's really forced a real conversation. But the positive thing is, certainly the colleges that we've been working with have really, really taken this agenda on board with an enthusiasm uh, which is refreshing. So there's lots of good work out there. The first thing that people started to do was try to understand what it is, that, what, what is the perspective of, of, of these young people and, and why are they so impatient? That's the other thing that's changed. People are impatient now for change, impatient for change. And it's not just kind of people of colour, you know, women, other minorities in inverted commas are now fed up of, of, of the, the amount of time it's taking now to create, to, to lay bare this system uh, and to create proper equality. What COVID also has done is expose the deep-seated inequities within society, okay? So intuitively, if you were to answer that question, you would probably say, no, it's not. Uh, particularly inclusive. And then if you go a little bit deeper and look at the, uh, the, the, the kind of four key factors uh, which might help you decide or create an inclusive curriculum, uh, the curriculum itself, the content, 
conscious inclusion, the professional ability, knowledge and skills of teachers and curriculum leaders and managers, their ability to actually to, in, to interpret, to, to change, adapt, to, to make sure that um, that, 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 that kind of uh, curriculum is inclusive of, of, of all different types of people. And of course, then you've got the intelligence, uh, inclusivity intelligence of, of staff, leaders and managers within colleges and indeed the learners themselves. You know, how inclusive are they, are they of all the different people that they come across and, uh, and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis? And of course, the fourth factor is the will. Intuitively, without research, from what people have said to me in the networks, that we've, I would say, not yet. I don't think the, the, the curriculum is inclusive yet. And I'll just pause on that. Thank you, Masala. I'm mindful of the time, so I'm not going to sort of pick up some of this. I'm particularly aware that um, we have a question from Sophia Boots, Cindy, which I think you wanted to answer. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, I think the, the, what I wanted to say was my point about soft skills and enrichment is more about how the curriculum is designed. And actually, I think it's, it's probably, you know, what, what you were talking about, Solak, which is if, if the curriculum is designed in a way that is applied and includes many of these elements, then you're not approaching it from a deficit model. What you're saying is that's what good curriculum looks like. And I think that that's the point. So I don't think the point was that it was a deficit model. I think it was more designing something that is truly inclusive. Um, yeah. but understanding that inclusivity means that you also have to think about individual um, students or individual you know, communities or regions as well. Thank you, Cindy. And I, and I think um, I would like to add that I think it really is important that you know, we've talked about role models, we've talked about representation, and in order for the curriculum to be more accessible and relevant to all learners, I think it's important that we do have that opportunity to be able to be representative, celebrate difference, ensure that, you know, we have history that's kind of, you know, shared and taught to everyone. And I think more so now, because, because of technology, the global village is shrinking, because we have to prepare all of our learners, not just our black and minority ethnic learners, but all of our learners, regardless of their ethnicity, you know, their gender, regardless of the protected characteristics that they might be represented, that we have to prepare people who can be successful. And I think if I take this back to where we started with Altaf, it's about raising aspirations. It's about ensuring that we can engage and nurture and enable people to thrive and that is at all levels whether they be staff whether they be governors whether they be learners and I think those three things for me are interconnected they're not in isolation and on that point I'm very conscious of the fact that we might have overrun with time a little bit but um, it's been a really important uh, discussion and one which of course is the beginning of a conversation and I hope that we have the opportunity to progress this in another webinar. Thank you. Thank you uh, Rajinder and thank you to everybody on the panel. I think um, um, I've, I've run quite a few sessions uh, about leadership and about curriculum over the last uh, year or so and we never have enough time but I think it just goes to show um, how much of a conversation that we need to have to drive that action that we want and I think the frustration is, is that there's if I think about uh, we just gone past the one year anniversary of George Floyd and the, 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 the month to two months that followed that situation uh, in, in America. Um, there were so many, so many conversations that were happening, so many pledges that were being made. And it wasn't just to do with um, the Black Lives Matter, but it's to do with the whole agenda about what we're teaching our children, what message are we sending out to them, and um, what role modelling are we putting in place so that they can actually be what they see more so. And, I, and, now, and now I'm sitting a year on, I'm thinking, you know, what has actually changed? Um, and I think that the, the highlight for me is that we're actually able to have these conversations which may have fe felt a lot more uncomfortable a year ago. I think they definitely, um, not necessarily just on a webinar, but actually within our institutions, I think these conversations are becoming more comfortable. And I don't mean that in a complacent way, but more comfortable in the sense that people are actually starting to acknowledge that this is a, a challenge that we all need to address and that we all have a part to play in that. Um, and I'm glad during this session, the... Um, 
the um, subnormal was was mentioned because I had a, a massive load of pennies dropped for me uh, when I watched uh, subnormal, and I've also got the book by Dennis Cord. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't read that book, um, there it is. Um, there's my copy. But the, the pennies that dropped for me were that um, we had a system that was geared towards the failure of a certain group of our of our community, and everything was geared towards them. And then we saw the birth and the utilization of supplementary schools, which added that enrichment for those students in terms of how do they engage with the communities that they come from and still be part of the society that they're going to live in. And it was, it was such a difficult balance that those, that those young children were going through and their parents and their guardians were going through. But it really sort of like, um, for me, opened up my eyes in terms of there are things, and you know, this is in my lifetime, and I'm, and I'm really young. Um, like super yes. young um, but it's in my lifetime that this has all happened and I'm thinking I still know teachers that are teaching today that were teaching then or were just starting out in their careers so we can't just say that was then and this is now people were taught to teach in a particular way and those people are still in the system I'm not saying that we should remove those people but I think there is a level of education and a level of support that we need to give a, a, a wider community within the people that provide the provision so that we can come on board with this yes Regina. i was just going to add to that point of and that is i think this is where institutions have a real responsibility when we talked about um you know we can't talk about this subject in isolation of the culture of organizations i know absolutely absolutely and 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 it is about a culture shift and it is about a culture shift from not from a, not from a normal to what should be should have been the normal in terms of where everybody is is uh, taken for who they are and allowed to flourish within the organizations whether they're mm -hmm. a learner or a professional within that organization so i think that's probably a good place to stop but um just touching on that last point that you made before you handed to me um is that there will be other webinars some of these topics will be a lot more in depth uh, i think they deserve to be a lot more in depth but also action led as well in terms of really looking at showcasing the people who are actually involved at the coal face of this and actually doing the good work out mm. there within the colleges out there and i think they need to be showcased and there isn't a one size fits all and i think hopefully we, we can expose that but you really need to take a um a look at your own institution and see what works for your institution in terms of the, the mix of people that you've got and your aspirations so i think we, we are going to explore a lot of this and the questions uh, for those people that are, are attending today and have posed some questions or have looked at the questions we will be um, creating some articles around the q and a's and um, the panel are going to get an opportunity to relook at some of those uh, questions perhaps give it a little bit more in depth response or a more of a thought through response rather than while they're trying to juggle the tech, the tech on a live session and type at the same time. But I think just before we go, I think it'd be really, really good if I can go to each panel member, uh, as we've done in the previous sessions, is just um, for you to think, what do you want the people that are attending this to take away? I know this could be difficult as a one-liner, um, but in terms of just some nugget, a, a nugget, a golden nugget that you want somebody who's listening from your perspective to take away with them. So, Jeff, over to you. A golden oh. nugget from you. I'm not sure if I've got a golden nugget. Um, last year, I was um, there's a young woman from Tottenham, and, and they, I think Tottenham's important. Uh, she's a black woman, and she described herself as an angry black woman. I don't think she was, but that's how she described herself. And she was going for a job in um, the Royal Borough of Kensington in Chelsea. And she was really nervous about um, going for that job with a, a black woman from Tottenham with her black Tottenham accent. And these are her words. These are not my words. But anyway, um, she got the job. Uh, and she was buzzing because she said, I, I went in. I didn't change my voice. I was myself. I was my authentic self. And they wanted me. Uh, and that's, to me, that is representation. It's someone who thought differently. And Kensington and Chelsea needed someone who thought differently to shake things up. And she was exactly the right person uh, for that job. I think more organisations can look to the additive as opposed to the assimilation. Thank you, Jeff. Solat. I think, uh, one very quick one would be just to look at the, uh, the you know, the manifestation of systemic uh, inequality within your organisation. We all have them. It, there's no shame in it to admit it we have them 
Um, there was an example uh, in our, at our Grand Awards ceremony where I was very switched on to the whole thing about non-binary and, and, and not being gender specific, um, but I didn't translate that or didn't tell uh, other external speakers. So it was ladies and gentlemen all night. And I'm very kind that we had um, somebody that uh, came back to us, one of the corporates and said, look, uh, I just want to share this with you so you can improve it next time. You know, when, when people say ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where, to, where I fit in with that. So, you know, we all have it and we shouldn't be ashamed because it's natural for us to have it. Let's embrace it, look at it, and then start to unpack it and, and remove some of these barriers that uh, to, to people that are a part of the system. That's a really good point, Sala. Thank you for that. Cindy. Um, so um, my, my point, um, I think, is I think it's great that we're talking about this, but I think there's still loads to do. But I actually think that young people are our hope and i think that the world we live in now is so different that they will accelerate this change for us and i think we need to amplify the real role models the young role models of the stephen bartlett that i talked about marcus rashford malala they are there and and other young people are going to be looking at them and looking at their pathways and looking at their journeys and thinking I could be prime minister at a but back to your point. So my hope in this conversation is they're going to hold us to account to drive the change. And, and that's where that's, that's the kind of, that's what I'd like to finish with. That's a really good message of hope. I think. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, almost natural segue out. Uh, just a couple of points. I'll be very quick of um, firstly, if you are in the business of education, uh, whatever your role is, thank you. I salute you. You've been absolutely extraordinary, folks. I keep doing the hard work. And the gold nugget is when you walk back into your classrooms, folks, next week, you could be seen in your institutions a future prime minister. I don't want to be the only one who's got <laughs> that passion. I don't really care. So walk in. It's a really important point. Every single person you come across, you infuse with your drive and your integrity, folks. You are remarkable. So let's have that across the board for the future future prime minister will come from one of our institutions but I think I might get there first not that I'm competitive <laughs> <laughs> there's a gauntlet that's been thrown down thank you Malta. um and Sheila well I'm definitely not the next future prime minister but I am the next future further education commissioner and and I feel really positive going into that role knowing that there are so many leaders in further education who are passionate about inclusivity and want to make a difference. So it's been a fascinating discussion. There's more we can learn from one another, but we've got that ambition and we need to stick to it. Thank you, Sheila. I'm gonna now pass the final word to Julie, who um, instigated this uh, series um, with a little brainchild with a discussion with Reginda. Um, so it's quite apt. Um, uh, a good few months ago and um, so final word to Julie in terms of what do you want as a takeaway perhaps not just from this session but just in general I think that might be a good way to wrap it up. Thanks um, thanks Arv yeah and uh, it's been a, a delight working with Reginda and then more latterly with you to, to get this off the ground and I hope it is the start of the conversation and the sharing and the, the working together and the amplifying the issue, the challenge, and our, and our responses to it. My um, my takeaway from today's session, and I've, I've got so much from all three of the session, but from today's session is actually the, the point that Solat made earlier about the brain making connections and joining things up and seeing the same thing in different different places. And what that's really reinforced for me is that actually that that very practical activity of decolonializing the curriculum, so that the the role models that we all learn about are diverse from different backgrounds and not from that is is such an important thing to do um, and I, I think it's something that our passionate aspirational teachers can really enjoy doing as well really enjoy reshaping that curriculum with their students with other stakeholders and and that could be something to 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 re-excite the sector in terms of, of of building that that curriculum future I think over the the course of the three sessions there have just been so many amazing insights personal insights from staff and students expert insights from from panel members um, I can't wait to see the 
the podcast coming out of it and to revisit the questions and to look at the answers and to to use that from a very selfish point of view for us to use that as Milton Keynes College to shape um, our journey but also to get it out there and to encourage others to have these these dialogues and I think that overriding message that we've heard at every single one is it it is great to have these conversations but it needs to lead to, to action and uh, at every level, individual, institutional. And I think the power of the voice of FE, we've underplayed it. We do have a lobbying role. We can influence um, policy. We have created uh, a generation of skilled, technical, vocational staff who actually I think we've got the opportunity to not just empower, but to really give voice to on, on that national stage. And, and thanks to you, Al, for bringing mine and Rajinda's chats <laughs> to life into something really spectacular absolutely thank you, uh, thank can, you. can i just um, yeah. add one final thing and that is that i hope that this is going to be a long-term strategy and not just something that's short term because for systemic change to take place we have to have that you know embedded and ongoing not just um, something that happens and then we lose it no uh, absolutely um and um i know that i probably casually mentioned it to Julie that um, I'd like to do more of these and then focus in a little bit more depth but I think I've just publicly announced that we are doing more so I think we now have to but that, that's the wonderful place that is Milton Keynes College is that we come up with ideas and sometimes they're live on live on air and um, we now have to follow through with them <laughs> so that is something that we can do but if you're watching the recording later on whenever that is in the future do reach out to us with the same message if there's things that you want to um, raise, anything that you want to discuss and move forward and discuss it in the in, in form of either a webinar or articles that you want to write or you want to share or podcasts that you want to be part of or other discussions in any other format, please do reach out to us because we are creating um, a, a bit of a hub moving forward in terms of where all of this is going to sit, where people can access it free and use it and personalize it however you choose to do it and, and use it as part of your own development um, but the key thing for us with an MK college is that this is a reflection of the conversations that we're having internally that have been going on for years and and now we're in a position where we can start sharing a lot more with the wider community and we're really looking forward to developing ourselves but also encouraging that type of development in the wider sector so from me Thank you to every single person that's attended or watched this. Um, to the panel, thank you for your honesty. Thank you again for giving up your time um, to be part of this. Watch this space, I would say, in terms of what comes next. And so that's for us, FE Voices, the third and final session of this short series. And I look forward to seeing you soon.